uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here on Friday night uh, for, uh, to our thought leadership forum on entrepreneurs and innovators and economic uh, of Sri Lanka. Uh, to get this event underway, let me ask uh, Chairman of uh, Stanscorp and Senior General Manager, Senior Vice President and General Manager of the Sri Lanka, Mr. Mansoor Great to see all of you here. I think quite a lot of uh, new faces and some old faces. Uh, first of all, let me welcome Dr. Harold for being with us. His first visit to Sri Lanka. I hope uh, this is a string of many visits that you come over here. Um, I, I want to also thank uh, US Embassy, Microsoft, uh, to really uh, sponsoring and supporting the event. I want to take a moment to tell you why we're doing this as from a Slashcom uh, point of view. Uh, I think there is uh, two kind of major drivers that why we feel innovation and entrepreneurship is really ripe for acceleration in Sri Lanka. One is, uh, not Sri Lanka, I guess globally, uh, one is the, uh, the availability or the ubiquitous availability of technology, right? If you look at the cloud, social, uh, mobile, and, and all the enabling technologies that you need to build a company, today is available at almost literally no cost, right? you know, very, very low cost. If you think about 10 years ago, trying to build a technology company, that the investment that you need to put in to get started uh, is prohibitive for a lot of the a lot of the entrepreneurs. Today, though however the platform has uh, come of age that you can create a technology company almost instantaneously if you have a great idea. That's that's on the one hand which is driving why we are focusing on that. The second uh, is the whole uh, uh, increase of millennial so younger workforce and younger consumer base, which is really connected consumer base, which is really making it right for uh, technology-based businesses to uh, uh, flourish right now, right? Because the technology, again, 10 years back, if you build a technology company which requires uh, access to a large pool of people, you would have been very limited the, the population that you can access today in Sri Lanka. Uh, almost 100% uh, penetration in mobile and very rapidly uh, smartphone adoption is going. So I think with these two, one is from a consumer base being very digitally enabled and on the other hand the technology platform being uh, very uh, available at a, a, a very, very uh, uh, cost effective uh, uh, position. I think we are at a uh, inflection point of being able to take these two and create businesses. Uh, that's why we are focused as a, as a slash to be able to create that environment. Today, in fact, the only thing that probably limit you from creating a great technology company which is which can go global is what is in your head, the idea and the innovation that you can come up with. Right? So, uh, slash mission and drive uh, is, is to really enable and create that ecosystem, create access to funding, create access to thought leadership, uh, create uh, inspiration, having people like Dr. Hal coming here, uh, you know, opening our eyes and giving some uh, thought uh, for the entrepreneurs and our goal is to get to 1000 startups by 2022 in the next uh, 9 to 10 years and that's really what we are working towards and uh, uh, once again I want to thank Dr. Harold for being here and we have a great panel today. I hope you guys will ask questions and uh, that we don't have to have a lot of questions among the panel but with the audience and I think we have a great uh, panel also that will assemble today. So we hope uh, to having a very engaging session uh, in the next hour or so. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madhu. Um, Madhu, describe to you uh, kind of uh, background to why we do events of this nature. I'm going to share this at some moment of my time, uh, of your time, talking about the other initiatives uh, that we uh, that's come undertake in terms of entrepreneurship um, and so on. Uh, the reason being that uh, we hope uh, to be able to partner with us um, on some of these things uh, going forward as well and we will be able to participate um, um, in, in some of these events as well. So uh, let me just run through uh, some of what we are trying to achieve. We want to be the number one industry uh, in terms of value addition and also in terms of exports in Sri Lanka by 2022. Uh, we want to get to $5 billion in export territory, 200,000 jobs and as one said, uh, a thousand startups, right? Um, and in the context of these thousand startups uh, is where we are going to focus on in terms of entrepreneurship. Uh, we are looking at five key areas, right? Number one is to open up markets uh, for startups. 
very key challenge for startup companies is to be able to market their products, uh, particularly internationally. And we are working with a lot of uh, companies, a lot of Sri Lankan diaspora uh, who want to, uh, you know, help startup companies get their products to market. Uh, number two, we want to have develop uh, more entrepreneurs with the right skills. This is where our thought leadership uh, programs are coming in. And we have, uh, you know, uh, renowned uh, speakers on innovation like, uh, like Dr. Ravishe. And also we had a young entrepreneur, uh, uh, Shruti, who was down here for six months ago. Uh, with the assistance of the American Embassy, we had another uh, thought leadership forum as well. And I'm told uh, that quite a few people who participated in that thought leadership forum then continued to keep in touch with Shruti and, and was introduced uh, to a lot of people in uh, Silicon Valley. Some had actually gone to the US. I am through the contact actually met up uh, and yes, we are very happy to kind of uh, facilitate that kind of process uh, happen. Uh, access to technology, infrastructure uh, and funding, that's again, that's where our partners like Microsoft, who have been one of our oldest members coming. Uh, they have, uh, Wellington is here from Microsoft, uh, he was in one of our initial committees. He will talk to you about the kind of free software that is available for, uh, for startups. Uh, we have other member companies with such products as well. Over the course of the year, we will introduce you to each of them and the kind of products that they have that you can use uh, to develop your startup company as well. Uh, improve and simplify the regulatory environment. As you know, uh, one of the uh, main sources uh, of funding uh, for startups uh, in other countries is something called crowdfunding. And obviously, in Sri Lanka, you can't have crowdfunding because PayPal, uh, you cannot uh, you know, remit uh, money through PayPal into our bank accounts. So we've been working with ICDA. Uh, and uh, CPSL and others to, to, to kind of uh, remove this restriction. Spoken to Jayanth the other day from ICT and, and there is a lot of progress happening on this front and I'm sure that that will happen. Uh, we've been also looking to other factors that inhibit growth. For example, registering a, a .LK uh, you know, name costs something like $40 here as opposed to a .com name that costs 8 to $9. So again, we need to work with uh, those who are in that framework to make sure that these kind of costs come down. Kind of regulatory uh, barriers are removed in terms of, of uh, startups. Now, obviously, uh, enhanced culture and community engagement. One of the biggest, uh, you know, uh, obstacles to startups in this country is the culture and the mindset. Harsh is there, I tell you, uh, you know, uh, the kind of uh, uh, cultural uh, blocks that are there for, for those who want to start their own company as opposed to being an employee, either in the government service or, or in you know, lucrative paid employment. Uh, in the private sector. So you want to change that as well. So you get the whole gamut of, of uh, you know, activities to make sure that this whole thousand startups that Mango is talking about comes uh, into fruition. So I think there are uh, we have a uh, couple of initiatives going on at the moment. I'll talk to you about some of them. So uh, slash for Motorola Lighting University Innovation Championship. The finals uh, for 2013 uh, will be held on the uh, 4th, 21st of February uh, at the University of Colombo uh, School of Computing. We had a record 150 projects submitted by university students in this country this year. Um, and we have finalized 17 teams uh, from uh, 12 uh, universities for the, for the uh, finals, which all of you are invited to come and watch. It's uh, open throughout the day on, on the 21st February. And last year's competition, that is the 2012 uh, one, uh, was actually selected by the Motorola Foundation as one of their best projects in the whole world. Right. Uh, that they fund one of the best projects uh, in the whole world. So we are very uh, glad uh, to be a part of this initiative for the last few years. Um, the MIT Global Startup Labs program. Uh, this year we are partnering, uh, they are partnering, Rubindu uh, just walks in uh, with his uh, food and now he's hiding. Rubindu uh, is running this initiative. Uh, we partnered with uh, a small university called MIT in the US, in the academy. Uh, they have been running this global startup, uh, global uh, startup lab program for the last three years uh, with one university and this year they have opened it up to all universities and is partnering with, uh, with uh, Stascom and, and Brandix as well and we will work uh, on this going forward as well. So uh, I think 73 Sri Lankans uh, are expected to launch projects by August 2014 and I think there were 350 candidates who applied. So that's a great achievement uh, in terms of the kind of initiatives that were taken. And I think there is a timeline on, on how this will happen. So we are we're glad that we are one of 15 uh, locations in the world where it might be works on this. Uh, so I think we will be trying to work with other uh, recognized universities in the world to bring their entrepreneurship program uh, to Sri Lanka as well. We've been working with uh, Spark IT as a resource part, a partner from the Council of Commons. Uh, we've also worked with uh, other uh, you know, engineering, Sri Lanka engineering network as well. Uh, 
providing resource people for their events. Uh, ICTA uh, has this wonderful uh, startup program called Spiral Relation, and we've also been a technical part, uh, partner of them as well. And uh, some of those companies have been very well now. Um, we continue to sponsor the Entrepreneurship Award at the National Best College Software Awards, and that's because we want to make sure that there's a platform for those who have grown their business to be recognized and then take their business to another level. Obviously, we've started uh, you know, uh, specific industry specific competitions like Tourism 2.0, with the American Chamber of Commerce, and we are trying to extend it to other industries as well. So, you see, we have a whole ecosystem uh, of the kind of things that we're doing. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook uh, in terms of our activities on entrepreneurship as well. So as I told you before, um, we have, we would like to introduce you to the kind of products available, preferably by our member companies, but also by our outsiders, to help you start your company and enjoy it. And one of our partners for this particular event is obviously Microsoft, and, and I'd like to invite Wellington. He has uh, a VISPA program where they provide free software for startup companies. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, that program. Over to you. So for me, personally, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here. Um, members of the Nipano chapter, and uh, colleagues, friends, but the most important group, the startup companies, and uh, the SMEs who are here today. Starting a company is not easy. Uh, done that, been there. It's, it's a nightmare to be very, very honest. The people who have done that, I salute you because you have done the done a very brave thing. Uh, so that means the biggest hurdle in your entire journey of this beautiful place that you have started is done. But then what else? So the industry, Sascom and partners like Microsoft is there to support this initiative. So let me tell you in the next 15 minutes about what Microsoft can offer in this big picture of 1,000 startup initiatives. Plus, to anybody here who's running a software development setup. But let me also take a step back and tell you a little bit about what Microsoft really is. 38 years ago, we were just a startup with two people. We were like Paul, side by side in one room, sit, sat down, built DOS, built Windows. Then the company grew. Today, we are the number one software company in the world with uh, offices in about 100 plus countries and presence in 190 countries. Already 100,000 plus full time employees, and we <coughs> even move continuous stuff. So it's a massive setup. But don't forget, it was a startup not too long ago. A remarkable journey. Uh, as of yesterday, we have a new CEO, the third CEO, Satan Adara, who's heading the company, who will steer this entire setup in a totally new direction, uh, transforming us to a devices and services company. So, but still, might I emphasize that we were a startup company not too long ago. But the strength of Microsoft worldwide is our partner. We have over 700,000 partners building solutions, building software applications. That's our true strength. The ecosystem, what Bill Gates envisioned, to create this very strong ecosystem. That's our true strength. So when we have more and more partners, automatically companies will succeed. The ecosystem will succeed, and uh, the vision that Sascom has to generate $5 billion. To, I mean, within the next three years, if we can manage to find maybe 1,000 startups, I don't think that will be a big challenge. Because let me tell you during my presentation why it's not going to be a big issue. But entrepreneurial ecosystem is way beyond just starting a small setup. You need parties like investors to chip in. Uh, without money, there's nothing much that you can really do. I still remember about 14 years ago when I started doing my own thing. Uh, used to be the office PM to the developer to the architect and did everything. Uh, amazing, you get a real good kick out of it. Then we had to 
at one point give a friend who won. But at that time, if I could find an investor, I wouldn't be here. But at that time, there was no SaaS uh, There was no other incubators to support people like us. So I'm glad in a way that I get a chance to come and talk to you with a great program to support startups. The big thing is the technology companies such as Microsoft needs to play our role to enable the new company. That's where the real magic is. This talk is a program that Microsoft launched five years ago with a very strict set of guidelines, but with the fifth year. Fifth year actually reached last month. We expanded the program with another bunch of benefits. So it's a great program. Don't just take my word for it. Let me tell you what it really has to offer. Then I have no doubt that you will really do it. So what this part can offer to you is basically a whole heap of software for you to kick start your business. It's simple. Today, if you want to start a business, on top of your hardware and infrastructure investment, you will have to look at having proper software. If you are thinking of, oh, I can buy them at a very cheap price and uh, start my company, you are doing the very wrong thing at the inception. If you are trying to build intellectual property, but you are not, going, you are not respecting someone else's intellectual property. And this doesn't only apply to Microsoft, it applies to any software solution built anywhere in the world. And this part will offer you the latest cutting edge software solutions to complete this thing. If I take a startup setup which has five developers on Microsoft technology, for you to just kick start, you will have to invest about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars. Developer tools are expensive, but they deliver great value a great processes for any company. <coughs> but what we can offer is, we will give you that initial set of things to complete it. Then we will also provide support. Great tools means nothing without support. Just giving tools to a bunch of developers will not get anything done, believe me. Microsoft Freelancer, locally we will chip in to provide that required training, guidance, and support to get you to that next level. We will do that. And also, this part worldwide will provide you a great deal of visibility. The program already has, as you can see, 85,000 startup companies signed up. 50,000 of 32,000 of them have completed the first three years of their existence. That's a phenomenal milestone because Majority of the startup companies worldwide don't survive that first year. If they survive the first year, that means they are up to something good. If you're done with your second and third year, most of your worries are over. But there's a set of criteria as all these things. Uh, the startup company must be developing software. We will not offer it to a services or solutions delivery company. Then it has to be a privately held company by the set of people who are actually running it, not a, a third party owned or a, a publicly held company. You can later go public if you make that big bucks. That's all fine. Uh, then you have to be in operation for less than five years. Uh, Last year we had another set of criteria, uh, stuff like we had to be less than 10 employees uh, as hardcore developers, plus less than 3 years in operation. But in the fifth year, uh, we have to do something to celebrate, so we expanded the little bit. Now we are no longer too much hung up on the 10 people or 10 developer count. Uh, we take it case by case and enable companies. In Sri Lanka, we have already activated about 45 startup companies with this talk. Uh, ICTA invited us when they launched Spiration a couple of years back. So we immediately went and offered the entire program. So through that, a uh, couple of companies actually got the maximum benefit out of this. And now they are building great solutions. Some of them are already out there on web. 
on desktop and on mobile devices. What we will provide is basically a great deal of software solutions plus the support and also the subscription accounts that you need to build applications on uh, Windows Phone, Windows 8 and Windows Azure Cloud. But we did more. We created another uh, subset of it called Vispark Plus. So earlier there was another program called Vispark One. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about Vispark Plus. What this will offer in a nutshell is basically a bunch of additional subscriptions, additional benefits for you to kickstart your products on the cloud. Uh, if your startup is powered or empowered or supported by an accelerator, we have a bunch of uh, signed up accelerators that we work with in the region. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have one yet in Sri Lanka. Uh, if the industry works together and creates one, that will be a great uh, benefit for all of us. So, two accelerators, and if your startup is signed up with an accelerator, we will provide a lot more benefits. We have a program right now uh, for any startup who builds a Windows Azure cloud enabled solution, who is backed by a reputed, accepted, registered uh, accelerator, we are willing to fund up to $60,000 for a company to go to that next level of rate. So, a bunch of accelerators that we work with uh, globally, this doesn't apply to us that much because none of them have any operations ongoing here. Now, let me tell you what we, how this channel, how this mechanism really works. We have a bunch of people like me sitting in different countries, Microsoft, whom we call Vispark Chance. So, all the yellow dots. We have about 800 of them worldwide. The good thing is, if any of the local startups need to find, a, find any type of support in any other country, Microsoft Sri Lanka will step in and help you to get that. We will link you with the Vispark Chance worldwide and uh, make sure you get that right level of support. <coughs> Then we have Microsoft Innovation Centers, uh, there's few in the region. So if any company wants to get some support and help, uh, that's also open. Here, unfortunately you have a name with me. Ramya linked to the entire world of this park. So you have no choice but to work with me. But I'm a very nice person. I have supported a lot of companies in the last few years. A uh, few partners who are here uh, knows that. So, don't worry. <coughs> Locally, we have been hosting a lot of training sessions, a lot of guidance, consulting sessions for startup companies. Uh, I personally work with four of them. Uh, I didn't get permission to mention their names because of the nature of competitive products that they're building. But believe me, they have grown from two people to ten people, fifteen people. That gives me the kick, the guts to go and help them even more. We have, most cases, quarterly training sessions for these companies. <coughs> these are not attended by large audiences like this, just five, six people, uh, meeting a couple of our MVPs. Oops, what happened? Uh, and they get to, they get exposed to the latest technologies, best practices, uh, industry-wide uh, <coughs> platforms available, so they get to engineer the cutting edge solutions, uh, even as they are first set of solutions. So that's what this part can really, really, really offer. Uh, when it comes to technical support, this is the most demanded thing from companies. Uh, we have limited resources, but we accommodate as much as possible. Whenever a company says, okay, I'm stuck with this solution, and so on, uh, we will make sure that we give the maximum uh, output to, make, to, to help them to succeed. So that's the commitment that we can really do. A few links for you to remember. For anyone here who is interested in signing up with this part, just go to the site, sign up. Uh, fill the forms correctly, please. Half of the requests that I get are half made. Either they are not too worried about putting a good description, telling us what their company is really about. What I do is I make sure I call them, find out what they really do. That takes a lot of time, but that's a much needed thing at this point, but we do that. And if they're a worthwhile committed startup, we make sure we provide all the benefits. 
The biggest question, let's see, I love my rough lines. The biggest question that comes out uh, once I talk about this, this part. What happens after the first three years or first five years? Any smart answers? It's simple. If you're operating a company for five years, and if you are not at that mark where you can self-sustain, you can go win big deals or big products in your own, you should rethink your startup strategy. Seriously. But most companies that we have worked with worldwide have reached that milestone by their first, uh, by their third year, which is great. So that's what this part really is all about. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. If anyone has. No questions means I really have understood everything or nothing. So very good. One question. Uh, yes, sir. You said software. Yeah. Does it also apply to uh, software being part of the innovation? Device, yeah, okay, so I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. You said that this part is only for people who are doing software. Yes. That can the software be only a part of the total? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if the company is building embedded solutions, uh, we will say. And, the, uh, and one thing that I didn't mention is it doesn't really need to be 100% on my care building hybrid solutions, collaborative platforms, still we will help you. Because today, no longer a Microsoft only world. We collaborate with pretty much all the other platforms out there. So if you are building solutions on open source technologies, our cloud platform will still come in handy for you to uh, go to the market. Uh, to sign up for this talk? Absolutely. Even when you complete the first three years, uh, you can just uh, we will actually title you as graduated from this part. Right. That's it. <laughs> There's no like hidden fine print saying oh, end, of, end of the three years you have to pay for everything. Nothing like that. Uh, that's something that we have to deal with the customer. Because always they will deploy a solution and the end user's production environment licensing will apply. Uh, the licenses that we are providing for free, industry ready software, is for your development setup on it. Go and deploy them in our side work. You can deploy your software. Uh, for an example, let's say your software solution is a SQL server backend. We will provide a SQL for your server, all the versions for you to build your solution. But when you deploy it in your customer's location, the customer will have to purchase a SQL. <coughs> okay. All right, thank you very much. Around, uh, if you want to ask him any, any further questions. And uh, I'm told he's uh, under 38 years old, so his whole life. Uh, you know, in this uh, under the period of, of what Microsoft is his company. So that's what that's the beauty of of, of technology. A startup you can go from nothing and escalate very very fast. And that's why we're promoting it so much with the economic development of this country. Now we we'll move on to uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Carol J. Ravish. He's the president of Innova Innovation Strategies International Agency, uh, which has projects in uh, Asia, Latin America, and India. Uh, he serves as founding board member uh, of Vision Technology Systems, the US division of Singapore Technologies, and he's a, found, he's a founding director of Biogen, which some of you may have heard about. He manufactures patent the technology that converts biomass, uh, synthetic gas production of electrical and thermal energy. He previously was board member of several electronic uh, generation and financial organizations. I actually heard someone talk about biomass because that has been actually one of those uh, technologies that have uh, been promoted heavily uh, in this country as well. Uh, Dr. Ravishe is internationally recognized as an innovator for research in this case, business growth uh, and economic development. He has extensive uh, experience in America, Asia, Latin America, India, and many other nations. Uh, he was an entrepreneur in residence at the National University of Malaysia, 
uh, and has conducted innovation workshops around Asia and uh, is an advisor to Saigon High Tech uh, Park Innovation Center. The whole lot more uh, of, of, his, uh, of his profile, which I'm going to skip and hand over uh, uh, to our next speaker, Dr. Ravishi. And thank you so much for coming down here and agreeing to speak about it. I want to encourage that we have a dialogue, so please ask questions in real time. I'd like to come down if I can, uh, and maybe uh, I'm going to work this at the same time. While the loading is a PowerPoint, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the U.S. Embassy, uh, Slashcom, and Microsoft uh, for their putting <coughs> this together. And what I've heard just now indicates there are elements of an ecosystem that bodes well for Sri Lanka for nurturing the next generation of entrepreneurs and innovators. The opinions that I express are my own, obviously not of the sponsors, and they're based on my experience in uh, traveling uh, around the world. People ask me where I live. I live on an airplane. About half my time is in Asia, and I'll explain. Uh, Get the first PowerPoint up. So, as a founding director of Biogen, uh, we work for equity. We draw no salary from the company. Uh, all of our money goes into uh, keeping the company going and incentivizing the employees. We cover uh, not only the company, but all of our own expenses. We take nothing out of the company. Uh, as a founding director of Vision Technology Systems, we are sponsored by Singapore, and we uh, work as investment bankers. We buy companies, mostly U.S. companies. Many of them are public. We take them private. Uh, we incentivize employees, executives, and to grow revenues. Uh, last year, we provided the largest return of any Singapore finance company, 42% return on investment. We have now over 6,000 employees, uh, all with technology-based uh, companies. For my own enterprise innovation strategies, I conduct innovation workshops, advise governments, and you'll see examples of that as we go along. Okay? So please, let's ask questions. Now, why Innovation and Entrepreneurship for Sri Lanka now. The only way to build the economy of this country is with small and medium-sized enterprises that are sustainable. We heard uh, glimpses of that earlier. Those that last more than three to five years will create the employment base for the future economic growth of this country. As important as multinational companies are, they do not create the internal wealth. So if you look at some of the countries which we'll talk about, their success has been to grow companies founded by Taiwanese, Koreans, Singaporeans, etc. And that has to happen in Sri Lanka. I addressed the students this morning at the University of Waratara, and I said to them, you are the future of your country. My hope for you is you realize your dreams. So, we have to count on the next generation. So, unless you have new generations of entrepreneurs from that group, the country's not going to change. And your data show, oh, sorry, how do we go back? Whoops. Your data show that we need more female, more women entrepreneurs. What are the qualities of entrepreneurs that we're talking about? Expertise, imagination, commitment to pursue goals, and not being afraid to manage risk. We at Biogen are totally at risk. We have over $7 million in the company. We draw no salaries. We are totally at risk. We do that because we believe in our product and we believe in our employees. We have to ask yourselves, you have to ask yourselves, do families today, does the culture in Sri Lanka encourage innovation and entrepreneurship? 
or does it encourage people to do incremental progress? Do, does the K-12 system nurture entrepreneurs? Do the universities graduate students to be, create jobs, or do they graduate students to find a job? There's a fundamental difference. Are there role models? I mean, Slascom is one. You mentors and role models are key to growing the next generation. Without them, it's not going to happen. That part of the ecosystem. For those of you who are practicing entrepreneurs like myself, I just want to say some few quick things. It may take longer than you think to realize your goals. Are you going to achieve profitability with investment or customers? I would urge you to think about growing with revenue. It's harder, but down the road, you'll have more of your own company. You have to manage costs unrelentingly, especially in the beginning. You have to be absolutely fanatic about managing costs. Put everything back into the company, into incentivizing employees. Networking, networking, networking. Every trip, I meet new people. Every trip, I find new opportunities. It never stops. You network. And one of the great things about working with entrepreneurs is they share their time. Whether I'm in Silicon Valley, Route 128, Taiwan, Korea, Singapore, people share their time. We trade war stories. We help each other. Marketing today is very different from the past. As important as social networks are, you are not going to generate customers on the internet. You have to meet them face to face. You're not going to get a serious purchase order unless you meet the customer. She or he has confidence in you that you're going to deliver what you're going to say. You can't do that with a website. Cannot. You can start. Those are good tools. But it's face to face. Same with investors. They're going to look you square in the eye. You want my money? Are you going to deliver? Or do you have integrity? Do you have passion? You can't do that digitally. It's face to face. Today, marketing is very different from just creating a website. You must put yourself in the shoes of your customers. Understand their goals. Understand their technology, their service or product, and then say, how can I create value? What does my product or service offer to my customer that creates value? If you can't answer that question, you're probably not going to get a lot of customers. What I see as I travel around is a sense of urgency. Tonight, I leave for Singapore. I'm on the board. We sponsor the air show. I have many meetings. Okay? Now, when you think of Singapore, you think, well, maybe they're very happy. I have every one of Lee Kuan Yew's books autographed by him. Okay? Privileged to know. So maybe you think, Okay, they're happy and they're sort of coasting along. Wrong. You think they're happy with just the National University of Singapore, which is very prestigious, or Nanyang Technological University, or the Singapore Management University? No. They started a new <coughs> university last year. Look at it. It's interesting. The Singapore University of Technology and Design. No academic departments. They're trying something new. Design woven into different areas to stimulate the next generation of entrepreneurs. No academic department. Something very bold. Okay, now, I told you about what we do. We create return on investment from Singapore. They get value. They get revenue back at home from the revenue that we generate with their capital. Okay? And we create jobs in America, too, of course. Now, gardens by the bay. You have to see this. It's in a phenomenal botanical garden in Singapore attracting tourists. So not only are they developing technology, now they're attracting tourists. It's an amazing environment. Okay. Um, I'm giving you personal examples. Taiwan. I will be there the week after next. Now, I was inspired by this, personally inspired. So I was at dinner uh, last fall in Taipei uh, with one of my friends. I advise uh, his company called Acton, and he's kicking me under the table. I said, look, you're not paying attention to this guy who's sitting next to you. Better talk to him. So I started. He sold his interest 
and his company for 10 billion US. Rather than travel around on his plane and play golf, he said to me, I don't see the next generation of entrepreneurs in Taiwan. Can you help us? I said, are you serious? He said, absolutely. I went back the next month and he put together a working dinner with about 10 other people like himself, very successful entrepreneurs. Instead of staying, you know, enjoying their wealth, they are worried about the future of their country. Now, in February, on the 18th, I said to them, if you want me back, each of you have to invite another three to four people like yourselves who are committed. Now we have a group of 50. We can change the country. Okay. Korea. Last, in 2011, President Lee, was president of Korea at the time, had a committee on science and engineering education. They reported right to the president, no middle person. They invited me to give a workshop with the challenge, what do we do to diversify our industrial base? The Korean model is different from Taiwan. Big companies, Hyundai, Posco, Samsung. What do we do to diversify? My recommendation was, you, ha you don't have a software industry in this country that's of any significance. Please invest in that. That was in June. The following April, I was invited back to give the keynote address. They made a $160 million investment matched by a company, another $160 million, $320 million to develop software institutes. Serious, serious commitment. Is this the next Tiger Cub? This is a photograph of Najib and I am in DC, Prime Minister of Malaysia. In 2010, he announced that was the year of innovation for Malaysia. Came to Washington, I was privileged to meet him. Within months, I was appointed entrepreneur in residence in the country, based at the National University, to help do startups. There was no culture for that in Malaysia before. Serious, serious commitment. What are the options for Sri Lanka? Okay? You can swing for the fences. Try to hit a home run with a blockbuster product. That requires more investment in R&D. We need to convince your government to spend more, of, remember, these are my personal opinions, no one else's, more of its GDP in R&D. You have to do that. Second, SMEs, you've heard that discussed. That's a proven track record. Sustainable SMEs are the best source of creating jobs. Sustainable means they've existed for three or more years. Best way, proven track record. Groom tomorrow's innovators. Those are university students. If they're coming out just looking for a job, they're not going to create a job. They're not going to change the country. Not going to happen. Accelerate commercial innovation. Tax incentives for angel investors. Tax incentives for corporations to invest back into their companies to grow. Sri Lankan companies. Access to capital for SMEs. If there aren't incentives from the federal government to provide capital, the companies cannot grow. I'm going to recommend accelerators for the country. We'll get back very different from an incubator. Now, the person from Microsoft alluded to them. It's one-stop shopping. Without spending a lot of money, use existing facilities and create business accelerators in Sri Lanka now. Look at GDP spending in some other countries as percentage of uh, R&D spending as percentage of GDP. Let me ask you, I, I, you'll guess it now, what country in the world has the second highest number of startups on NASDAQ? Israel. Israel. Yes. Simple. Not only investing in R&D, simple strategy. Very simple. Every man and woman must serve in the military. Now, here's what they offer. If you study engineering and science, that exempts you from military service. If you get a PhD in engineering and science, they will pay you as an officer. You'll have not only all your educational expenses covered, you'll have net salary. But you must work on technology related to national security or defense. So what has happened over years 
is they've created these technologies, many of them have commercial applications, and now they created companies. Very simple. Very simple strategy. If you look at the countries that are investing, like Sweden and South Korea, uh, Taiwan, it pays off. Sri Lanka must make an effort to invest in R&D. Quickly about intervention and innovation. When people talk about innovation, often they talk about only part of the equation. Innovation is not just something new. It's realizing its value. And the value is realized by entrepreneurs. Often, the person who has the new idea is not the person who can create value. In my previous experience at the university, president for over 20 years, every time we let the inventor be CEO, we had a perfect record of failure. Perfect record of failure. Why? Inventors are not business people. CEOs, entrepreneurs of small companies are very different from CEOs of big companies. Very different. Every time we saw a perfect record of failure. It's not that these people aren't good. Different skill sets. You're an entrepreneur starting a company, you have very different skills. I claim that you can smell them. They have a fragrance. The world does not have enough entrepreneurs. People who can start a company. They are very focused. They're not afraid to take a risk. They don't take stupid risks. They manage, take manage risks, and they motivate people. When you find them, hold on to them. Do not let them go. And the challenge here is to create the next generation. I already said that. Wherever entrepreneurs work, they create value. That's the wonder and the beauty of entrepreneurs. They can be organizational. It doesn't have to be a high-tech startup. Go in and change a government organization. People have the courage to do that. I get asked this question frequently. Are entrepreneurs born or bred? Okay? Like Obama says, it's above my pay grade, the answer to this question. However, from my experience, it's the environment. They're nurtured. An example is your neighbor, India, has one of the lowest outputs of intellectual property of any country. Yet, when Indians leave India and go to the U.S. or Europe, they become very successful. The environment in India does not stimulate entrepreneurs. Yes, you have Tata and Reliant, but they're the exceptions. <coughs> they're the giants. Okay? All right, so the question you have to ask yourself is, do your universities graduate? Are they preparing entrepreneurs? You have to ask that question. I want to give some examples because so often people think that you have to develop a, a new stem cell or a new uh, satellite, something really big to do, create a company. I want to give different examples to show that encourage people that you can do something without having huge amounts of experience in physics or software, okay? Let's give some examples. And then, of course, there are high-tech cases. Social, low-tech, and low-tech is not a pejorative term, which means that there's not a lot of technology. Okay, Teach for America. There are parts of America which are uh, where the school systems aren't very good. Inner cities, rural areas. A group of graduates, turned out from Yale University a few years ago, just three years ago, started a teaching corps with money from foundations and uh, gifts, and now today it has grown. Multi-million dollar budget. The front page of the business section of the Daily News this week, on Monday, said that micro-lending reached over 60 billion rupees here in Sri Lanka. Simple idea. People don't have assets to do conventional bank loans. You have to empower them, right? They can't put up a house. They don't have collateral. And look how it's changing the world. It started in Bangladesh, won the Nobel Prize. And most of the people that benefit are female. Simple idea. This is in D.C., but I just see it in Manila. I work a lot in the Philippines. Not a country with a lot of resources. Here's an idea. Traffic jam. How do you get around? Get a bicycle. With your cell phone, you open the lock, you rent the bicycle, and you bring it back. 
It's in Manila now. Simple idea. Created a business. Don't need a satellite for this. Another one, Zipcar. It's all over America now. Oh, now to say, you live in Manhattan. You really don't need a car in Manhattan. Why? You can't get around, there's always a jam. And there's great public transportation. Okay? So you do need a car on weekends to get out. So what did these people do? They saw the need, they met it. Now, there are these zip cars at different locations in New York and now many other places. With your cell phone, you open it, you have to sign up, you open the door, start the car, and go. Return it to another spot. Easy. You don't have to go to Hertz or someplace else. It's right there in your neighborhood. Simple idea. Waze. Turns out that uh, Israeli-based company sold last year for a billion. A group of young kids got together and said, because of mobile apps and the cloud, we can create software to navigate through heavy traffic. Billion dollars. <coughs> Another group of kids got together and decided this is in Scandinavia uh, to do digital music service. It was valued at four billion dollars. I want to stress a different aspect of innovation. Now, I greatly admire the late Steve Jobs, but it was not just the technology, it's in the design of the product. Now look at, uh, how do we work this please? Oh, look at the glass. One of Jobs' visions was to have the product look continuous. So they had to get a glass that didn't break so easily. They went to experts in Japan and other places, couldn't do it. They had to invest their own money in R&D to develop it. Now, look at this. The, the metal wrapping around. Went around to machine shops, couldn't do it. They had to buy a whole bunch of CNC machines and experiment and develop. This is innovation. Now, look at the next innovation in manufacturing. This is the cost of materials for this product. Look at their profit margin, 48%. Not bad. Innovation in design, innovation in manufacturing. This is more high tech. But the point I'm trying to make is you can't stop innovating. Since you design the product, you have the glass, you have the metal wrapping, you can't stop there. Now you have to create more value. How am I going to make this thing at the lowest possible cost, the highest quality, and improve my margins? Simple example, change the world. You take it for granted today. Credit card, it started with buying on time. I don't have enough money to pay for something, so I'll make a commitment to pay one month, two months, three months. Today, we have credit card. Very simple. High tech, integrated circuit. Okay, what does innovation do? Innovation creates choice for you, for me, for companies. Today, you can buy a mobile device with features that you didn't have three months ago. Your motorbike, your car, your appliances all have new features. It's good for us. It creates choice, and in the market, good things win. Opens up competition. Competition is essential. However, what is going on now is that the pace of innovation is very rapid. So unless you're on this treadmill, you're, gonna, you're not going to be successful. Three things have to come together for innovation. Amabile is a professor I admire tremendously at the Harvard Business School. She says expertise, creative thinking skills, and motivation. Okay? It's in the Venn diagram here where they come together. Universities have expertise. Do they have motivation? Are they flexible or staying in their narrow discipline? Most universities operate in a stovepipe structure. Electrical engineering doesn't talk to chemical engineering, doesn't talk to physics, doesn't talk to the business school. Kids are in a lockstep curriculum, have no opportunity to experience anything else. Not good. Many universities chase research for the sake of research. My first job offer was from Bell Labs. At that time, AT&T was a monopoly. Six Nobel Prizes. The only person in America, in the world today, he's dead now, 
to win two Nobel Prizes in physics. So I wanted to go to an environment where all these Nobel Prizes are, right? Guess what? It doesn't exist today. Could not commercialize all this high-powered research. Look what Xerox developed at its R&D center. They didn't commercialize any of that. They had to license it, spin it off. Why? The focus on today's products, executives were afraid to take a chance to develop something new. So they missed the whole transformational opportunity. Christensen, who's also at Harvard, has a nice book, The Innovator's Dilemma, and talks about this for the whole book. People cannot come to grips. IBM Watson today is very different from what IBM, their research center, and it was 30 years ago. Okay, why is innovation so difficult to sustain? It's because it needs everyday commitment. You can't say, I'm going to practice innovation from uh, 9 a.m. to noon, I'm going to take a break, we're going to do business as usual. It doesn't work that way. When you meet an entrepreneur, they're driven. Every entrepreneur that I've hired that was successful says, leave me alone. You hired me to make money, that's what I'm going to do. If I need you, I will call you. And then, of course, you have to respond. These are driven, focused individuals who know how to create value. Today, most university education and research is incremental. It's not focused on innovation. You need a national framework for R&D. Sri Lanka has to develop this. I gave you examples of countries that have it. Tax incentives for angel investors. Now this is controversial in the US because people say, why should these people have tax advantages that I can as an everyday citizen have? Why? It's their capital at risk. If I'm asking you for a million dollars for my company, you're going to say to me, what am I going to get out of this? I can put it in the bank and do better. I have to convince you that you're going to not only get your money back, but you're going to get a return. And you, for that risk in helping me grow my company and create jobs, you should be rewarded. High risk, because sometimes it will fail and you will lose all your money. Cadre of entrepreneurs, capital for SMEs, access to capital, must have access to capital. Incentives for people to invest. Okay, fundamental questions to think about in growing a business. Is it market push? Are you pushing something in the market that the marketplace doesn't need, or is it a pull? What's the size of the market? If it's Sri Lanka, it's probably not going to have much of a future. If it's Sri Lanka, India, China, Asia, maybe it's more interesting. What is the cost of entry? People forget this. What does it mean to the cost of entry? You need a prototype. For software, your prototype has to scale. Hardware, you need a prototype that meets the market expectation. Otherwise, you won't get investors. You have the, the funds for that. You need employees as part of your cost. You're going to have manufacturing, you're going to have to have a facility as part of your cost. If you have patents, you're going to have to pay for the patent application and the protection of the patent, or patents, plural. All of these are involved in the cost of entry. If you're developing a new medicine, a new pharmaceutical agent, anti-tumor agent, or antibiotic, you have to go through a whole series of tests, Food and Drug Administration, and around the world. That takes capital. Competition. Almost every person that I meet that invents something new fails to think about the competition. They think they're the only ones. Every trip I take, I'm reminded there are a lot of smart people in the world. It is a huge mistake to think you're the only one with this idea. You may be today, but tomorrow, if you really have a good idea, someone's going to eat your lunch unless you're developing the next generation. That means you need capital not only to get your product out, but to improve it for tomorrow. Do you have, what's your advantage? Is it cost? Is it cost per unit performance? Do you have initial customers? The best way to attract investors is to have customers. Show them. How did jobs start? He built on a revenue. He had customers. You have customers, 
a purchase order, you can go to a bank and borrow money for the term of that purchase order. You don't have to go to the private equity market or venture capital. Getting customers. You have to secure your customers. Business plans are not 100 pages. It's the elevator pitch. Okay? Imagine you're in an elevator, you go into the top of a high rise, and the person next to you is a potential investor. If you haven't told he or she why you're adding value for them, by the time they leave the elevator, you're done. I raise money all the time. People ask me the fundamental questions. Size of the market, cost of entry, competition. If I can't answer that in about a minute or a minute and a half, next guy. If I can answer that, they'll spend more time. Go into depth. You've got to get the essence of your idea out immediately. Can't be a half hour. Too long. <coughs> prototypes, prototypes, prototypes. You have to have a prototype. Most people fail because they're... Look at the... Oh, okay, this is my personal opinion. Well, look at the embarrassment in the United States. Now, over there. Healthcare, right? Some famous vendor developed the software. They developed it for a pool of 25,000 people. They didn't scale. Should have been tested for 250,000, 2.5 million. It was a national embarrassment. So when you have software, it's got to scale. That's in your prototype. Does your prototype scale? Now, universities generally do not have the capacity to address these issues. That's why they fail in commercializing technology. To address these issues, you have to have the infrastructure. Rather than spend money at all the universities, I'm going to recommend an accelerator because there isn't time to get the resources to do this at the universities. Okay, we already went over this. Prototypes. Okay, now, financing. This is the key part. This is the valley of death. That's when people fail. You have to have a strategy to emerge out of this valley of death. In the beginning, you may have to put your own resources, go to family, friends. Then you angel investors. Our route is through revenue. You have to have customers. You can do it. So at having a plan to get capital is key. It's your business plan, the executive summary is the most important part, and your prototype. This is the time when businesses have to decide whether they really have something to make. This is when your expenses exceed your revenues. The commitment of one of my partners, we needed a capital call last October. We had customers, but it was a cash flow. Didn't have the cash on hand. This particular partner has had a lot has a lot of resources. He couldn't liquidate the resources. It wasn't people weren't buying. You know what he did? He went home and told his family he sold his house. They weren't happy. They had to move. But he sold his house, got the capital, put it into the business to keep our key employees. We're not going to get anywhere without our employees. Okay, these are just examples for discussion and many more of what strategic directions Sri Lanka might take to develop businesses. Now, when I have agriculture here, you may say, well, this is not really high tech. Wrong. When Chen Shui-bian was president of Taiwan, I was one of his advisors. We go around Taiwan, you should see the R&D parks that they have to grow citrus, to grow mango, to grow tomatoes that can be shipped, retain their color, retain their fragrance, retain their taste. Israel's a desert. In addition to developing satellites, they now have put a huge investment to products that they can ship and export. Food products. Huge investment in agriculture. 
maybe high-tech agriculture can help jumpstart the Sri Lankan economy. So, recommendation, launch accelerators. Very different from incubators. Incubators are a real estate deal. You have space, people go, you let them work, have access to universities. This is accelerator, one-stop shopping. Don't spend money on building a new building, use an existing facility at a university, at a company, whatever. Okay, that has to be customized to the needs of the region and to the opportunities in that region, whether it's agriculture or software or manufacturing. You can't have it, uh, you know, you can't take a, a shotgun shot, it has to be a rifle shot. Very clear, very focused. It has to be overseen by a board of successful entrepreneurs. People who have the experience in winning and losing to say, okay, let's take this company into the accelerator. It takes judgment to do that. Right? You need advice, you need resources to do a prototype. I've already gone over the importance of that. You're going to need legal advice for patents or for trademarks. You're going to need uh, business plan assistance because often uh, people don't have the facilities to develop the right business plan, angel capital, and investment. So this concept of an accelerator brings all of that together. So if there were a national mandate announced by the president, supported by parliament, we need a few accelerators, people may step up. There are Sri Lankans in this country who have been successful. Let's get them to step up to it as members of the board, as investors for tomorrow's generation. They've made it. Let's give back to the country. Okay? So I, I want to emphasize how important this is for the future of Sri Lanka. Okay, so what's the value proposition for the country? It's, it's job creation and growth. Remember the beginning. 40% of your population is under 24. The others are going to need jobs and social services. So if we're not getting from the 0 to 24 tomorrow's entrepreneurs, the country's not changing. What it is today will be tomorrow. It's not going to change. Serious. Very serious. You'll attract investment capital. If you start taking the steps that we've outlined here, people will come and invest. Why? Because investors want to make a return. They'll see this is serious. You'll have new revenues for the federal government because of growth of companies. And you'll be positioned for partnering with other countries and for the global competition. The global competition intensifies daily. I tried to give you some quick examples of Singapore, Taiwan, Korea, Malaysia. It goes on to Japan. It goes on to Europe. So it, unless you get on this idea now, the competition is going to pass. It'll be very difficult to catch up. Okay, so that's the story that I'd like to leave you with, and I would like to have some discussion now or questions on uh, how to proceed, how to transform Sri Lanka. Right? We're talking about transformation, not incremental. We're talking about doubles and triples with some solid base hits. Okay? How do we transform Sri Lanka? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Avishay. We will come to your questions during the panel discussion. Uh, a couple of takeaways from Dr. Avishay's presentation. Number one, when uh, Indians go overseas, particularly to the US, they end up as CEO of Microsoft. Right? So uh, people are talking about the great uh, achievement for, for, for an Asian to go there, and go there and get that kind of high profile position and the kind of exposure that this region will receive as people do the Google search of who this uh, Satya Nadella is. Right? Number two, uh, I spoke about women entrepreneurs. At the moment we are working on a very uh, interesting initiative uh, with uh, another member company uh, on, on trying to bring uh, 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 a professor from INSEAD who will sit uh, with our women, uh, core group of selected women entrepreneurs uh, and, and, and do uh, intensive workshop to make sure the kind of skills they want uh, uh, happen 
Um, we will obviously talk to you about that in the near future when it becomes more fruition, but uh, I got the good news today that uh, our partner, uh, who is also a member company, will, will uh, are proceeding on this and we will inform you about this uh, very soon. The third one is about uh, R&D spend. Uh, you know, Israel and Sri Lanka share one thing, which is a very high percentage uh, of our GDP on defense spending. But if Israel is able to uh, provide 4%, I wonder why we can't, and that's maybe one of the questions that we can debate, um, you know, on, on uh, our panel discussion. Um, while I was sitting there, Professor Ajit asked me an interesting question. He asked me how much this, does this event cost to put together? So uh, I told him that was confidential information. However, it was expensive, and the reason why we are able to, uh, you know, give it to you free is because we have corporate uh, partners. Sponsors is a bad word. We use partners. Um, so there are a couple of messages from our partners. Uh, I'll allow this team from Citrus to play them, and uh, uh, then I'll get back to you as well.
Um, Line Park has used us. Um, I went for the promotion. Great. Uh, you don't need an invite for it, actually. It's on the last Thursday of every month. Um, it's at FDOs at the moment, uh, and you can come and, and buy a drink and, and meet with those from the industry uh, as well. When we are ready, we can pay that again. We have one more uh, individual from uh, Microsoft, Ranil. Uh, I hope he's around. Ranil will talk to you. Yes, he is. He'll talk to you about Office 365, another product that you can use um, in your startup. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I'm Ranil. I work with Microsoft. I'm in the enterprise space. Uh, excuse me, because uh, this is the first presentation that I'm doing with uh, SMEs. So if I don't understand your business, please excuse me on that. Uh, but I'm trying to keep it, I've done some research and I've identified certain challenges that, that you all might face in the small and, me, small and medium enterprise space. So, if you look at the uh, screen, your ideas are your business. Okay? You need to be able to access those ideas whenever you want. You need to be able to access, work on those ideas whenever you want it. And also, when it comes to uh, using professional email services, Okay, it's very important because recently I was doing a Office 365 implementation with one of my other customers, but it's not for the main company, it's for the field agent. Okay, one of the things that they came out with saying that uh, the challenges that they faced, the agents, was the credibility that they, when they go in front of a customer, that the credibility that they face when they use, you know, other email services. I'm not talking about Google or Microsoft, I'm talking about, you know, just free, freely available services. That credibility that you give out to a customer is not there. That's where the professional email services come into play. Alright? And also, if your technology is down, there may be situations your business also goes down. Could be a possible scenario. If you look at certain companies, small and medium, if you maintain your own IT infrastructure, if the IT infrastructure goes down, that means your business could be impacted as well. Right? And also, maintaining your own IT infrastructure in-house, that means in your own premises, maintaining that is a cost for you all. And also the maintenance contracts, that means you are running your own IT, you have to maintain that, you need to think about the upgrade of those services, that is a cost for your company. That's where the cloud computing com comes into play. If it be Microsoft, if it be any other vendor, cloud computing is a better thing for small and medium enterprises. All right? Because when it comes to SMEs, the priority is not IT. Right? Your focus is towards something which your, current, your, your business, not towards maintaining IT or anything like that. That's where we come into play. Okay, what is Office 365? Anybody knows what is Office 365? What contains in Office 365? <coughs> you should at least know one product, okay? So Office, Office Suite, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, you all might be familiar with those things. Plus, business class email, okay? So, like, okay. so if you look at the screen, uh, it's basically Office Suite <laughs> is included in the Office 65 service, and also email, then you have content management, that is basically documents, document management. And also, if you want to communicate with your colleagues, or if you want to go beyond that and communicate with your partners, uh, uh, customers, you have that facility as well. Later on, I will touch base on you know how our communication tool integrates with Skype and all. Okay. Uh, so those, those four products, office, email, communication tool and also document management. Those are the four products which is contained in the Office 365. Office 365 is a service that we host in our own data centers. Basically, for this region, we host it out of my, uh, Singapore and our backup data center is out of Hong Kong. Why, if you ask me why Hong Kong, why not another country? Uh, the reason that I got from my uh, backend people was we always position our data centers 600 miles apart, that because that's a, uh, theoretically, it's, uh, geographically, 600 miles apart, two earth plates will not fall in. Okay, so Singapore and Hong Kong are 600 miles apart, and if an earthquake happens on one plate, obviously, theoretically, it's, it 
won't happen on the other plate and the other data center will take over and still provide the services to our valuable customers. Okay? So for this region is Singapore main primary data, uh, primary data center and the backup data center is out of Hong Kong. Uh, and also, if you look at the other components, the technical support. We have a 24 by 7 uh, uh, telephony support system that is running out there. So anytime if the service is down, you can always call them and get technical support. It doesn't mean that it's going to, we always provide the customers a 99.9 .9 uptime. It's guaranteed. And also it is financially backed. That means if we go beyond that service level agreement, the uptime that we guarantee you, we will always, in the next month, we will be providing you free credit for you to utilize our services. And also simple IT management. The startup like you all, you all don't need to be maintaining, say for example, if you look at the big corporates, they maintain their own identity in their own premises. For a startup company like you all, you all don't need to. You all don't need. You don't need to have those kind of services running in house. Therefore, for we all we provide that identity service on the cloud itself. That means when you are logging into the machine, your security is provided, and also after that only you will be gaining access to the main components like the email, content, uh, the conferencing. All those things are given access after you authenticate <coughs> authenticate yourself. So all those services are actually provided to you on the cloud as a part of the package that we provide to you. Uh, one important thing that I want to talk about when it comes to office packages, as you all know, if you go to some uh, to a retail store and if you buy office, you can only install it on one device. But with Office 365, we actually give you the right to use the office package on up to five di different devices which you use. That means you could be using a tablet, you could be using your PC, you could be using a mobile device, your mobile Windows mobile or uh, Apple iPhone or Android device. For any of those devices, you have the access to use Office package. That means if you get a, if you're on the move, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to do some edit or something like that, if you want to go through a presentation, if you want to uh, go through an Excel sheet. You still have the capability of going through of doing all those things while you're on the move. If you are, whatever the device that you're carrying. Each individual user has a right to use the office package up to five devices. All right. So, uh, talking about email, uh, how much do you think uh, a corporate would give to their users as an email box capacity? I'm not talking about the consumer services, I'm talking about as a corporate, what kind of capacity do you think that the corporates would give? Any guesses? Okay, the average is about 100 to 200 MB. Senior level managers you would give GBs, but then again the average mailbox size of a corporate is about 200 to 100 to 200 MB. But with Office 365, we will provide each individual user, depending on the package that they uh, subscribe to, 50 GB of email data. That is about more than uh, 1,000 times far uh, better than what a corporate would provide. 50 GB of data. Imagine if you are if you are so, planning to implement those services on your in-house servers, the cost that you will have to incur when it comes to backend storage, 50 GB into 25 users. That's huge. Okay. If you put that figure and if you put it into a corporate, that's the same amount of storage that the corporate would invest on on their backend storage services to provide email services to a user. But with the cloud service, we provide that capability to our valuable customers. Okay. And also, content management. That is basically a product called SharePoint. We have the capability of uploading documents there. You can, it doesn't mean that you, since you uploaded the document from here, you have to access the same document from this machine itself. Once you upload it there, whatever the device that you use, you can simply access the portal, download that document, work on it. Going beyond that, it doesn't mean that it's the only uh, you are the only person who has access to that document. Anybody who's out there, either it be a colleague of yours, or either it be a partner, or either it be a customer, anybody can contribute to that document. If it is a sales proposal or something like that that you're working on, 
you can simply go ahead and share it with certain people but with certain restriction you can say this person only has weaving capabilities or you can go beyond that and say okay this person has editing capabilities as well so that those kind of capabilities are inbuilt onto this service and also communication the communication backend tool is called link it's, it's a link plus sync put together called link where you have the capabilities of audio video conferencing chatting and also going beyond that you know you can do presentations if you are if you are here and if your customer is in some other country if you want to do a presentation all what you need to do is you, can, you need to simply send an invite where that person can accept it he can join online via the internet log into the presentation and while you are presenting you can simply go through that then and there itself you don't need to be meeting that person uh, face to face it's basically a virtual meeting that you are conducting so all those things are inbuilt onto Office 365. Okay. So just to sum up, with Office 365, these are the things that we provide. It's a cloud uh, service hosted by Microsoft itself. It's basically the same familiar applications that we provide to you all. You all are familiar with Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, OneNote. OneNote is something like you know you take down notes, but it syncs up. You don't need you don't need to save it up. It automatically saves up and things to the cloud but what, wherever you go whatever the device that you use no sooner you log into the portal uh, you no sooner you sign up it will just sync up whatever the things that is done out there to your device okay. and also anywhere access okay you might be using a couple of devices you might not have them with you whenever you're on the move but all what you need to do is a machine a kiosk machine or an internet connected machine unify you to connect to the uh, service and consume those services. Uh, also, the main thing, the security. And uh, when it comes to email kind of a service, all what you need to be very careful about, you know, anti-spam and anti-virus stuff. Okay. So all those things are inbuilt onto the Office 365 service, which we provide as as a bundle product to you. So you don't need to be worrying about, you know, email uh, emails getting spammed or uh, viruses getting infected into your own systems. And also the management. All what you need to do is you need to sign up through a portal, either it be or through your credit card, or you can sign up through other different mechanisms like you know going through a partner. But the easiest way is you can pay with your credit card. You sign up, you have a portal, you log in, you create your own users. You don't need to have majorly high uh, IT. Uh, you don't need to be IT savvy in order for you to uh, create your own users. Once you sign up, everything is there on the portal itself. You can create users, you can subscribe to certain services. If you want, if you are a question, uh, you, need to, uh, you need email, you need to be connected, all those things. So there are certain packages that will cater for that requirement. So assess your environment and based on that, subscribe to the server. And all what you need to do is implementation plan. Implementation plan is quite simple. We can guide you. We have our, a partner team who, will, who can always guide you on how to implement that. It's basically quite simple. For a startup company like you all, it's basically once you sign up, <coughs> everything is on the cloud. You don't need to be setting up anything on your premises. All right. If <coughs> any technical questions are uh, ready to take up the questions. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Slanin. Uh, um, Panel discussions uh, at SLASCOM events tend to run over time. So we've budgeted 45 minutes. Uh, we've done uh, some that have gone on for like one and a half hours, right? Because in the content is very interesting. And when I was listening to Dr. Avishe, I was wondering, my God, I'm happy I'm not Madhu today. Because um, he posed so many questions, uh, particularly, uh, you know, Dr. Dr. Professor Adit is, will have to answer quite a few of them about our university system structures and so on. And let's get straight into it. First, I'd like to invite the panelists to take up their seats, and I'll do a small introduction of each one of them. Uh, so let me start. Um, Dr. Ravisha is already here. Harsha, please. Um, so let me give you a small profile of each one of them, because all of them have, you know, put in decades uh, of uh, work experience. They have decades of work experience and achieved many things. Some of them are known to you. I find some are not known to you. So let me, uh, you know, make sure that all of you uh, know who they are. I'll start with my good friend uh, Harsha Purasinghe. Harsha is a serial entrepreneur who founded three software companies and a number of professional, uh, highly successful products 
uh, since his debut, as he has said so many times, at the age of 19. So he is one of those role models uh, that Dr. Ravishri was talking about. He founded Microimage in 1993 while uh, still in school uh, and uh, with a few of his colleagues. Uh, and uh, in 2007, uh, Microimage uh, Mobile was founded uh, for media and broadcast, uh, mobile applications, and also digital convergence. Harsh and I have been also working on another initiative, which we hope will happen soon. Um, some of the, uh, almost all the software that runs the radio stations in Sri Lanka uh, are from, uh, from his company and we are working on a training program to make sure that the journalists uh, can use not just uh, you know, microimage software but all software uh, so that they become much more efficient in their day-to-day -day activities. Uh, so he's considered one of the most uh, successful entrepreneurs in the country and uh, he's uh, founder of WSO2 Mobile as well. He was uh, recognized as an outstanding entrepreneur in the ICT BPO industry uh, in the year 2007 and has been awarded the CMO Asia Brand Leadership Award as the CMO Asia Brand Leadership uh, Awards 2011 in Singapore. Uh, Harsh and I are on the uh, Echelon Magazine's uh, 40 Under 40 Business Leaders uh, and I think uh, Shaminda is also here, the editor-in-chief uh, of uh, Echelon Magazine. Uh, hint ensure that both of us are uh, on the list this year as well, provided we don't jump the 40. Uh, I can assure you. somebody I personally respect, um, Sutilani J. Singha. Uh, he is uh, uh, an honors graduate from the State University of New York and Cornell, and uh, holds three BSc degrees in Business Administration, Industrial Engineering, and Economics. Uh, he returned to Sri Lanka and started work as a senior consultant at PricewaterhouseCoopers and uh, very quickly was promoted as head of planning uh, at Sampath Bank, uh, one of the youngest, I think, uh, in, the region, uh, in the bank's history. Uh, he also set up numerous funds, including the Region Sri Lanka Fund uh, and uh, more popularly Asia Capital, uh, and, and uh, was very successful and sold out of Asia Capital to take up a national calling as uh, chairman and director general of the Board of Investment of Sri Lanka. He was the youngest and the longest serving head of the BOI. Uh, he also is a co-founder of SLIT, Sri Lanka in Institute of Information Technology, um, and uh, serves as a board member for life. And he's also, more importantly, a uh, member of the advisory board of SLASCOM. Uh, in 2002, uh, after serving for a long time uh, in, in the private sector, uh, in the public sector, he returned as co-CEO at Asian Hotels Corporation. And um, if you see the, the, the whole uh, the, the Crescat Boulevard, the whole projects that John Keyes eventually took up, actually it was uh, Mr. Singer's idea, and then eventually John Keyes took it over and, and uh, developed it. Um, he, uh, in 2007, uh, he returned once again uh, after serving in many other organizations like the MJF Group and Overseas Realty to start his own company, TW Corp and is an investor in many startups uh, in Sri Lanka uh, uh, as well. Uh, next to, um, well, uh, next to um, Madhu uh, is the most affable and most popular member of, of uh, our panel, an academic extraordinaire, according to his own uh, description, Dr. Ajit Madhura Perma. He's a senior lecturer with over 27 years of experience. Uh, in local and foreign universities as well. He joined the University of Colombo's Institute of Computer Technology as an instructor at its inception. Uh, and then also uh, he joined UCSC uh, when they started off as well. He was uh, uh, dean of the Institute of uh, Faculty of Information Technology at the University of Morotua uh, from 2003 to 2006, and is currently head of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering of the Open University. And he has a whole list of other accomplishments, which I'm not going to uh, mention because I think quite a few of his students are in the audience as well. Uh, next to Prof. Uh, Professor Madhura Perma is Mafaz uh, is Isa. Mafaz is currently a director of Kalamanda Capital, a Singapore-based private equity firm. He is a co-founder of the Lanka Angel Network. And we wanted to make sure that there was a nice balance on, on the panel. So we have angel investors, we have academics, we have uh, entrepreneurs, we have Dr. Avishay, uh, and, uh, and uh, ex-public servants in, in, in Mr. Vijay Singha. Um, so, Mafaz currently serves uh, on the board of Coffee Bean, which we all have patronized and thankful uh, for having here. Takurias uh, on the Lanka Angel Network board as well. ADI Capital, uh, Board Shots Interna Investments, uh, Dance and Surf Design, 
and is a lecturer at PIM uh, as well. He worked for Holcim in, in Switzerland, Thailand, and Sri Lanka um, as well, and Solidiel and a whole lot of host of other countries. He had his primary education in the UK and holds a bachelor's in mechanical engineering uh, from Saudi Arabia, an MSc in aerospace engineering from the University of Texas at Austin, an MSc in information systems from the London School of Economics, and has attended various other um, professional qualifications as well. So um, we have 45 minutes, but Madhu, you can go on as long as you want. Uh, over to Madhu to uh, take up the panel discussion. And as Dr. Ravishi said at the very beginning, it's very important uh, that there is interaction. Right? So uh, I know Sri Lankans are very scared to ask questions. Um, so please, please engage with this panel. You will not get a panel like this for a while. Right? It's taken a lot of uh, you know, engineering to make sure that people are here. As soon as this discussion is over, Mr. Jay Singh will rush back to another event. And uh, Dr. Avishay will fly out to Singapore. So you very rarely get a panel like this. Please ensure uh, that you make the most of it. Madhu, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that long and elaborate introductions. Um, so I think we won't take uh, 45 minutes, we'll probably take uh, uh, 30 minutes and, and do a quick round of questions. Uh, I have, you know, I initially thought I'll ask few questions, but I want to really open this up for um, you uh, first. Um, and if there's no questions, I'll, I'll start that. But I, before we get started, just to, for the benefit of the panelists, can I quick have a quick show of hand? How many of you are either entrepreneurs or thinking about starting a company in the next, uh, you know, couple of years? Okay, great. Uh, quite a few entrepreneurs here. Um, so let me get started opening up uh, straight out to uh, questions uh, and in between there are a few questions that I want to ask um, and we'll, yes. The keynote speaker, you know, my question to you is that considering what has happened in the past decade, massive financial crisis is not going away. Don't you think that at this juncture, there is need to redirect investment and innovation towards preserving jobs and resources and environment rather than saving labor through smart machines which are eliminating jobs and destroying resources, not leaving much for the future generations. What are your thoughts and what lesson should Sri Lanka learn from this situation to go forward? Okay, th that's a controversial topic, but I, I would have to say that when you create smart machines, you create other companies and suppliers, so on the whole you create more jobs. Right? I, I believe in that and that's what I, I see around the world. Uh, you can see that in Japan, for example, very good in robotics. Now, I think because of the crisis that you talked about, it creates opportunities. Uh, I, I do believe that. And remember that in 2008, uh, Steve Jobs introduced one of his key products at a time of world crisis. So, because he knew he had something that the market would run to. So, today I see opportunity, and I think that technology that uh, saves time and improves processes ultimately creates other jobs. My name is Dr. Zorovic. Uh, question to Mr. Kilan. The future economy growth of Sri Lanka. So, how can we make Sri Lanka as an Asia economy hub? Can we make it in two years or three years? Okay. I'll try and answer as diplomatically as I can. Um, <coughs> let me answer from a personal perspective. You know, we became entrepreneurs during a time of war, and that made us more resilient. And we are now going through, in my opinion, an adjustment period. So my advice to entrepreneurs is that do not look for perfection. My philosophy has always been create your own pocket of excellence within the sea of mediocrity that we live in. And if many of us create small pockets of excellence, then that sea of mediocrity will become a sea of excellence. So let's not lament that what the government is doing or not doing. Be realistic on what the government and the current political leadership can deliver in terms of economic prosperity. And then just focus on what is the right business, the right career, the, the right way that you can fit into this socio-economic environment. Um, 
when we started Asia Capital, the country was at war, but we launched the Regional Sri Lanka Fund, the first ever country fund to invest in this country within three weeks of President Premadas and like a lot of people getting assassinated. So, in a, in a nutshell, what I learned also as chairman of the Board of Investment is that I, I, I went as a very idealistic 30-something guy and, and left rather disillusioned. But if I had tried to change the world or change Sri Lanka, I would have failed. But I think I probably achieved 15, 20, 25 percent of what I set out to do. And, and, and something I'm most proud of is, for example, was just Dr. Light Gamage and a few of us setting up SLIIT. Twelve years on, we have an endowment of almost a billion rupees. We have 5,000 IT students. Again, that little pocket of excellence within what we call the sea of mediocrity, which is the university system. And with due respect to Professor Holmes here, because why we started SLIT was after we summoned all the vice chancellors and said, why aren't you producing more IT graduates? And we were told of all the restrictions that the current state university system has to go through. So we, we created an institution that the state cannot interfere. The state cannot appoint a majority of the board, change the chairman, change the managing director, and we continue to function, though state owned, as an independent. <coughs> Uh, institution. So, I don't want to give too long a speech, but in a nutshell, that's my answer to your rather complicated question. Thank you. Thank you. You know, what I want to say as a chairman of the um, DOI, you know, in fact, if you were there, you were doing, I know that you have been doing that well and so on. Uh, I was offering a team with you when you were going abroad with our delegations. But what I want to say is, uh, you know, uh, now our president has been going off all over the country, all over the world, trying to get in. But with all the infrastructure and spending a lot of money and trying to get in, uh, bring in uh, uh, investors and so on, because what I, that is the reason why I asked you as a former DI chairman. Because actually if you were there, uh, I think it was in 19, I don't know, it was in 1980, Seven or something or ninety-five? Ninety-five to two thousand one. Yes, sir. So if you if you could continuing, of course, you could have made Sri Lanka as a precious economy hub. Thank you. Okay, but one day I want to ask a question from uh, Dr. Madhura Parva. I think uh, Dr. Madhura talked a lot about the university system and the ability for the university system or inability of the university system to create uh, innovations and entrepreneurship. Uh, Dr. Why do you think in our current state of I think most of our parents are like that. You know, uh, they would not uh, 
like I mean, they would like to see you know you send in uh, the son and go to the university. You would like him to uh, have a good job, you know, or some engineering job, you know, with big title, uh, you know, good office and whatnot. Then the other thing that that we have, you know, one one of the major things that I am trying to bring in some some sort of uh, entrepreneurship uh, culture into the student. The other one is the fear, you know. What if we fail, you know? I, I think it's it's in us, right? Uh, uh, then then we have other other thing that might be easier to solve, you know, like the support structure, right? Uh, with with uh, the industry committee, uh, we we have we have we need, we need funding, and I think uh, they are coming in. So I mean, these are problems that we can solve. Mentoring, I'm, 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 I know a lot of people who are, who are very keen on mentoring. Uh, then then we are bringing facilities. Then another one that uh, Harold mentioned was, you know, is there motivation for universities to become entrepreneurs uh, or build entrepreneurs or produce entrepreneurs? My, my answer would be no. Right? For, for, for a university academy, you do, you do some you know, really nice uh, research, it would be much more interesting to get a paper out, a research publication out, than actually taking that out to the market. Because that, that research paper would give me a certain point for my promotion and, and, and the, 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 even if I did a multi million dollar company, that would not give me any, any marks, you know, uh, in, in my promotion. Okay, of course I can leave the university and make a multi million dollars, but that's a different story. So, so there's, there's no, uh, it's very nice. If we don't have a motivation to push our, our students or who do this wonderful project towards entrepreneurship, there's nothing in it for us. And unless you know we have to uh, give some sort of incentive, the, the monetary, the recognition, the, uh, it, it will not come in. So we need, we need to we need to change that. Then the other, other thing that I see is you know this silos. You know I think uh, again he mentioned you know I, I had about six points uh, uh, mark and then he mentioned all 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 of them. Uh, the multidisciplinary nature, you know, we, we won't talk to anybody else, you know, okay, I'm, I'm an electronic engineer, so the world is, you know, is electronic engineer, nothing else, you know, we, we don't talk to human beings, we don't talk to management, so, so that, that, that has to come up, and then the, I, I think one of the things that would change is, you know, uh, I just asked Madhu whether the, 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 uh, went to uh, uh, which university, and uh, it, it's not, I mean, so, uh, so somebody from the university, you know, becoming uh, harsher, they are, can say, you know, hey, look, it's possible, even if you come to the university, you can become an entrepreneur. Because I, I know that many of the entrepreneurs are not products of our universities, but it can happen. You know, if we have one role model, I think that will make a big change in the, in the mindset of the other students. Now, answering your question, Mom, yes, we can do it, but it's, uh, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. Lots of universities are trying, you know, uh, uh, I, I know Morocco has an entrepreneurship program, uh, Open University has an entrepreneurship program, uh, Development Program has a program in I mean, everybody is picking up like, like we did it 10, 15 years ago, we talked about communication skills. Now we are doing it with entrepreneurship. But, but, we need, we need to need time. We can do it, but we need some more time. I guess, a lot of the famous entrepreneurs we know are the university of ours. I guess I guess there is hope for some CEO. You know, I can see the video clip to some extent. There is some focus of stuff happening. I wanna uh, you know, uh, mention some of the issues that are going on in the uh, city right now, right? That um, anybody here is looking to raise money in the next year for your venture. Any hands going up? That's true. Okay. So we have anyone here? Ask uh, a quick question. Uh, I'm sure you will have some questions for him. Uh, just to get started, um, you know, what do you guys look for when you're really uh, looking for uh, to find an entrepreneur or a venture? You know, what are the top two or three things that you look for, and, and, and you know, what kind of advice you have uh, for an entrepreneur who's trying to raise money? Um, it's centered around. It centers around the entrepreneur itself. Uh, is this person credible? Uh, can this person, you're looking basically to, do I trust this person to deliver? Do I trust this person with my money? Right? 
these two things, and it boils down to that. The second, the third important thing is, do they have the commitment and single-minded focus that uh, Professor Ravesh um, alluded to in terms of uh, are they very a focused individual? And sometimes that focus can come in many, many different forms. Do they, have they done something which is out of the ordinary? Have yet to meet someone who is, has climbed Lauda, for example. I'm not a mountaineer myself, but I, I like the mountains. It, who, who's achieved something extraordinary in their life. Is, is, is this the kind of person that you're going to... It's a bet, right? An investment is a bet. And Pilat will be able to tell you about that. And you, what, what you, you're betting on is, is, do they have the ability to deliver? Have they done something extraordinary in their lives? Are they able to maybe be interfered with? Right? Meaning, can they take on advice? I've met plenty of entrepreneurs. You know, people come and make pitches to us. Um, I'm making a little pitch for land. Um, on the second Thursday of every month, we have a session where you can submit your business plans and come and speak to us. But oftentimes, when, when some of the entrepreneurs are pitching, you see that they're, they're very, very, um, they're stubborn with what they want to do. And they're not able to take on board somebody else's advice. And some, some of the people who are mentoring or providing this kind of feedback are very experienced entrepreneurs, have done several businesses themselves. And it's, it's, it's a problem if, if somebody's not able to take on advice. Um, then all of the other things can be worked around. I mean, is it the market opportunity? Is, is, is it big enough in Sri Lanka? Are they looking at something big enough? Are they thinking, or are they trying to solve some small part of, of, the, uh, of a bigger question? You add all of this up and you get a, a, uh, the characteristics of somebody that you're looking for. And um, something, you know, is this a horse that you'll bet? So before I go to the next question, can I just ask anybody else who have a question from the audience? Um, yeah, same thing, what you said. Why there is such a mental barrier to listen to somebody's advice in Zimbabwe? You know, I'm from Pakistan. Uh, you know, post-retirement, uh, former chairman of SCCA and Kishan Commission, I have tried to convince a lot of people what wonderful opportunities are there in Sri Lanka. People are sitting on their land for 100 years, not making use of that. So what really is the value? I like to understand. I sometimes feel as if I'm living in a paradise where there's no need for innovation or entrepreneurship. A large number of Sri Lankans really think that they're living in a paradise. How do you take them out of this syndrome? Uh, um, the German economist once put it to me. He says, Sri Lankans are amazing people. Says, you take them out of the country and they work like nobody you've ever seen. They're very well appreciated in the Middle in the service sector. I lived in Switzerland and uh, most of the restaurants in Switzerland are, you have either Sri Lankan chefs so or you have, you have a, lot of, a lot of people working in the service sector there. They're well sought after. It says, but in Sri Lanka, they realize they live in paradise. And they, when they get up in the morning, they're not competing with a billion other people to breathe. They're competing with 20 million other people. And this is, this is, this is part of, it's almost inherent in the culture. We need to change that. I think it's changing with the evolution of the internet. I, I think if I just may add, I think as a nation, uh, you have mentioned that uh, having a national framework. I don't think we have a national framework for entrepreneurship. And I don't think we are yet a nation who has a world vision that is able to, this country, just as much as Sri Lanka was able to attract you, we need to become a magnet for attracting and retaining talent. We need to attract the diaspora, particularly the Tamil diaspora, who left, left our shores and went overseas. We need to attract people who have for 26 years that you know, we fought a war. 
the best grades left this country. I mean, there are some shocking statistics in terms of students who go to study overseas. I'm an exception. I came back. I'm, I'm probably the minority of maybe three to five percent of foreign educated US students who came back. We need to create a living environment, working environment, social economic environment that will allow people with capital to come into this country. So think such can we have such a world vision of becoming a magnet for attracting talent. The issues that we just mentioned will be the today. Uh, I would have loved to have seen a woman sitting on the panel. Uh, is there a plan, is for anyone, is there a plan to encourage uh, women in entrepreneurship? So, as Ivan mentioned a little while earlier, we are really happy that there is uh, programs as that comes driving and there is many other initiatives that they will do. Encourage women entrepreneurs. You might have probably answered that uh, and give a bit of background. Yeah, um, um, first, why we don't have time to ask these questions before. So, a couple of reasons we want a nice balance and few female entrepreneurs who are in our industry are not available today. Um, so, that's sad. And uh, obviously, you know, in academia and in many places, we don't have the kind of uh, category to be in the panel. That's number one. Number two is uh, what we've noticed about uh, you know women entrepreneurs. Is a very key on that is that they don't uh, participate in regular activities of the day. So we are looking at more focused several activities with uh, the So we are looking at uh, three different uh, uh, tables, looking at the sort of fusion, which Madhu is talking about. Actually, forgot to introduce Madhu. I introduced the young and I realized that. Uh, but even when he's not challenged, uh, we will work with uh, social development organizations to ensure that we identify them and then uh, you know, uh, give them mental and support that they require. It's, yeah, I don't want to publicly announce this, but one program is coming up in early March where we're looking at a select group of female entrepreneurs being mentored by a uh, you know, uh, very high caliber uh, point uh, you know, resource group and so on. So there is a program, but we don't really want to run a program unless it's in, in terms of yeah, while well, there's a lot more to be done, we'll just take some baby steps. I want to ask a, a, a quick question from uh, uh, Harsha, you know, who's uh, started companies, about to follow them in, 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 in this environment. We know how we, we think there's not a lot of things going right uh, from what we heard a little while earlier. Um, just tell us a little bit about Harsha. You started uh, you know, several companies over the last uh, uh, decade or so. You know, what was your experience? What are the kind of the top three advice you can do for uh, entrepreneurs who are starting up now uh, in that in that quest? Okay. Now, as when we started, the circumstances are very different. Uh, when I started back in 1993, straight out of school. You know, it's a war-torn country, people are in the uh, island, lots of my friends were going overseas. Everybody thought it would be nuts uh, to pursue uh, uh, and start a very small startup, uh, selling a piece of local language software, going from ministry to ministry, trying to uh, uh, sell and uh, generate revenue. Uh, so from that, that year, we didn't have, you know, this free internet, free smartphone, no angel investors, uh, no slash com, nothing, right? Um, to now, if you really look at the circumstances have changed, you have angel investors, you have so many other opportunities, you have mentors, you have so many professional bodies to help, uh, lots of forums like this, a lot happening uh, in the innovation ecosystem. So, uh, if you, so if I generalize and answer some of the key things, First is, uh, I think already Professor and also Mopas uh, echoed this, uh, is focus, absolute focus. When, when I started, uh, there was this product that we built, we wanted to, we always wanted to be a product company, because we wanted to be like Microsoft, because that was one of our childhood dreams, because we, we were so fascinated with how Microsoft uh, is building products, so we always wanted to be like Microsoft, we, so we wanted to be product companies, even though even the tough times, when we got the opportunity to build custom software, we didn't do it. We were just focusing on selling our product and differentiated at the right times. The next thing is, of course, the initial founding team. 
uh, the, 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 your initial partners and the initial team is very very important everybody share the same, same dream and work on the mission together it's very very important they, they, they can't have different directions and different ideas everybody sh should stick together and have the same passion and commitment so the last thing is of course uh, in my situation and even for any startup that matters I think again Professor <coughs> highlighted this very well managing your cost managing your cost and managing your cash flow it's so crucial at the beginning so these are the three things I would like to share I would just like to add as an entrepreneur a little older than you might just realize even in Brown the college uh, I am a firm believer, all the other principles of mentioned I have, but this, this particular learning experience is very important for you as Sri Lanka. The importance of what I call cross-fertilization. We tend to join companies that we think are culturally compatible with us. You went to a particular school, you played rugger, and therefore you joined a particular large conglomerate in this country. In my view, what has worked for me are happy very challenging chairmen, and when I was not chairman, and, and, and when I say CEO, chairman and boards, who have challenged me every step of the way. They come from diverse backgrounds. Um, I, I recall when we started Ceylon Trails in partnership with Dilma, uh, one of my investment banking partners, and I, you're you my not shareholders. He challenged the CEO to the point where there were literally arguments across the table. But today we created the most successful boutique resort hotel in the country. Anything Dr. Kedish to say, wow, Dr. We are going through continuous turbulence at the level of the board, at the level of the management, conflict, cross fertilizing. Do not rely on yes men. Even if you are picking partners, yes, there are some fundamental which cannot be compromised integrity, focus, all that has been mentioned. But try and look at a diverse skill set that will complement your own skills. Do not stay within your comfort zone. Yeah, I want to kind of extend that uh, answer a little bit that you, uh, you know, you've, you've shifted from being an entrepreneur, a bureaucrat, and then, you know, they can bring that to an entrepreneur and, and you know, like, you know, professional uh, business leader. You know, how do you make that transition? I think a lot of, lot of us probably get stuck once you get on one path, right? They need to be being able to make a transition and then get into an entrepreneurial uh, quest or, or venture. It becomes a bit of a uh, mind, mind block. Yeah. What has been your experience in Good question, I think I have the answer. My passion was finance, so therefore it was almost logical for us to, you know, a bunch of us, four of us, or five of us, to start on the Asia Capital to into investment banking. But I had to make a heart wrenching decision when the left leaning government of Chandra Kumar who got elected, when literally the capital markets and investment banking as I knew it died a natural death. To sell my shares and move on to something else. If not for that particular incident, if not for the fact that we were a country at war and the station to be running Asia Capital, but I knew and I made the right decision. Moving on, I realized that after I left the board of investment that investment banking was not a way forward. So I thought long and it took me a year to figure out that I had a passion for real estate. Left brain, mathematics, right brain, creativity. So the important aspect is that even though I, I, I did not have a background in real estate, is the fact that entrepreneurs need not necessarily be domain experts. Entrepreneurs are generally drivers of a vision and allocators of capital and pickers of people. And I found that formula has worked for me that if I create the right board, hire the right CEO or the right management team, and we are critically focused on delivering the vision and asking a very simple question that every business that I've co-founded, I have not founded a single business on my own, I mean, other than that you call, which is just my personal view. We ask a very simple question, what business are we in? Anything.lk, for example, I think the management is yet to get it, but I keep driving this point home, now it's for our what business are we in? Not to me. It's not an e-commerce business. We are in the business of disrupting the distribution inefficiencies in this country where we can get a product from manufacturer 
or importer to consumer far better than anyone else. So, so there's a fundamental difference in saying that you're in the e-commerce business and in the distribution business. So, so it's, it's, it's really an evolution. Uh, I, I would say but there are common skill sets that you take from one business to another, but you don't have to be a domain expert. You might have a friend who's a technology wizard, but if you're a good allocator of capital, good motivator of people, you should back that friend and, and our field, become his partner and start a business. Thank you. So, what yeah. yeah. uh, How do you, uh, in our business, in the technology business, uh, resources, key uh, element of, uh, how do you overcome the uh, resourcing challenge? How do you find the resources? Uh, how do you overcome the resources? You mean uh, hiring talent, right? Hiring talent and keeping. So it's, it's, a, it's a very good, interesting question. So a lot of people ask this uh, from me because, you know, my image is not that in the top league of. Uh, talent uh, acquisitions, like if you take World to SaaS to MIT or you know, a company like that, it's a tool. Uh, but you know, interestingly, I mean, I should not be sharing this. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, there are lots of, I, I look, I mean, at, at my community, we really look for really passionate people who can really cope. They don't necessarily need to come out of a, uh, uh, be the first class uh, university degree. I, 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 at my point, we really don't look for university degrees. So there are a bunch of talented people out there who are really good coders, which we have hired. And once they get into a company like us, once since they are building products and they are own staffs, and they are like entrepreneurs, they, they, they themselves work very hard because they got an opportunity to work on a passionate project. So these, these are certain uh, set of people, I think people like Virtusas and all those top people have not really uh, gone through. And they, I don't know, they probably did not get into their RNS. So I have, if you really look at, at my image, I have a bunch of people like that who are extremely talented uh, set of uh, uh, engineers. Some are actually working with uh, the company for almost 10 years now, 10 plus years. So that's kind of the kind of secret. So if you really want to uh, find talent, get out of that traditional uh, way of hiring uh, thing, and you, you you will be amazed the kind of people you can find. Can I? Yes. I think another thing that you should look at it. I mean, I mean, also the question, you know, are the universities doing something for entrepreneurship? Yes, I mean, things are happening, you know, like, like right now we are in this uh, MIT Global Software Labs uh, competition. I mean, I, I took an interest on this when I attended the pitching session last year. And at that time I was at the University of Notre and I, I saw some of my former students. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I, 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 had, I had tears in my eyes when I saw these people presenting their work. Because it was such a confirmation. I, I think you are looking, looking for talent. Yes, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Harsha that there's a lot of talent outside the universities, but even now the university talent is transforming. I, I'm, I'm sure that, that there, were, there were 25 uh, boys and girls who pitched at that event. I, I'm sure they would not have any problem uh, finding a job, which, which is unfortunate because they, they were supposed to be creating jobs, not, not finding employment, but I'm very, very sure that uh, whether it's Virtusa, or IFS, or Stacks, or <coughs> Microimage, I mean, if they go for an interview, I'm very sure that, that they will not have a problem finding those. So, so, so that, that is another another place that that you should look at, where, where the, the, the graduates themselves are going to transformation. I, I think the next step is for them to get to stay there, you know, become entrepreneurs rather than, you know, highly employable uh, graduates. Yeah, I'm guessing that. Yeah, I'm an author form of UI. You know, I would like to know the ministries, like the trade ministry, the, the, the economic ministry, the, the tourism, and the investment ministry. Are we having the, the ministers who are running the show with their team, do you think they will be successful to make Sri Lanka's economy to grow within two years? After all, if you know, you will be able to answer the question. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
going out of the way. Lord, I already took that. Please speak. <laughs> 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 we, are, we are just going through a post-conflict adjustment period uh, where ministers, ministries are being manned by people who do not necessarily deserve to hold certain ministries. Okay. So, so, in my view, is that uh, just as much as some you know, corporates who went out of business because they didn't hire properly, uh, you know, the country will not reach its optimum growth levels unless they have the right person running the right ministry or the right government organization. So, that realization, I think, is, is being felt very much within, within the public service, within the political hierarchy, and you feel in the private sector. Uh, and the constant thing that I keep hearing is that we don't have enough good people. We certainly have enough good people. Uh, they will hopefully come to surface uh, when the environment is able to attract them. I think the president should do something for this and get the top people to go all out and, and also to bring in more investors so then Sri Lanka's growth can go up. I, I, I actually like to give an, uh, share some of my views. You know, I mean, we can ask this question about the government and the, whether the government ministry is doing the right thing or the president and the entire government is doing the right thing for the whole uh, economic development and blah, blah, blah. <coughs> but yeah, at the end of the day, if you really want to make an impact, if you, if you are, I'm talking to the entrepreneurs out there, just if you start waiting till government do everything, you are not going to go anywhere. You need to, if, if you are true entrepreneurs, you have, you should be able to build something with whatever circumstances that is available. I, 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 I agree that a lot government can do, but if we all just wait ranting about government's inefficiencies, president's inability, and that and take all these forums uh, a political thing and start attacking government if we are we, we won't be going anywhere so what instead if all of us find out proper of niche uh, excellence and create successful startups and successful companies that automatically will drive change in this country that's something i firmly believe in because you know i mean we uh, if you look at my image story, we built a company during uh, one of the probably the most difficult times of history of Sri Lanka. Only a handful of IT companies existed and we built a product, a product engineering company. And out of scratch, today it's close to $2 million business. So imagine there are more entrepreneurs emerging and building similar business. I mean, if we have done it, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people else can do it. It will automatically pressurize the government to do a lot of other interesting things and probably change. It will bring about change. But if we are, without all of us doing our respective way, if we keep on pointing fingers, I, I don't think we would go anywhere. That's my view. As you said, yeah, president, you know, as you said, the president, I'm not talking about the president, I am president is going all out, he is going to various countries and trying to bring in investors. So we must have a good team to follow up. That is what I want. Okay, that's a question on the back press. But can I just uh, maybe give you one last, uh, like a quote, uh, what one of the said to Nascom, this equivalent of Slascom in, in India. He said, one of the said to the Prime Minister, said, you need to thank me. They were wondering and scratching their heads as to why. We kept the government out of IT and see how successful we become. Good uh, yeah. evening, gentlemen. Uh, I think I have a few questions and a comment about Madhu, what he has said about the women in Thailand. I think everybody can hear me. Uh, first of all, I think Sri Lanka needs changing mindset. You are the proof of all of that. You have broken all the traditional barriers here. That is why you are here. Now, my question is now, in our Sri Lanka system, the school dropouts all over is more than 40 percent, right? Uh, I'm glad that there's an academic professor also here. I'm a visiting lecturer of Morocco University as well, right? Now, are we? What are we doing? You all are all people who have made the, the out of box and you have made a successful entrepreneurs, right? We 
even you know I came to know last week, we have teachers who have been trained. The career guidance, 540 people in our education, right? They are supposed to tell our students who don't make it to the highest, like the O level, after the O level or A level role model. I'm working with the women, children, youth, men and women all over the country, right? And that's why I have a comment on Madhu what we have said. I'm also uh, Sarodhya Women's Movement Advisory Board member. Women are very persistent very dedicated and if you look at it all over the country there are now there is a trend going on so not the men now not the breadwinners women are the household breadwinners right okay and even our women now who brought bringing that what foreign currency so therefore i don't agree with you that because i'm working with the women as dr harold said the push we don't have the government or the entrepreneurs or the business, the corporate sector, they look at women in a different aspect, so to say gentlemen, but that is the reality. So that, that push we need. Women are very persistent, dedicated and committed, what you all all said. They are ready to go forward. So my question is, can't you come out for your glass doors and address the what is our children who are the future? I'm not going to say the future is a today, is a tomorrow, is their future. So what can you do? The drops, I'm really worried about the school dropout, right? To motivate, empower and inspire. Because you are a role model. You have to go out and talk about, make awareness, make them get out of that mindset. You have to have a degree, you have to be an engineer, you have to be a doctor. No, there are so many opportunities out there. So that's my question. Thank you. I think there are two, two parts to the question. One, do we, yes. what do we do with the school dropouts and, yeah. and what do we do with the women entrepreneurs? Okay. No women entrepreneurs. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Ajit to talk about <laughs> <laughs> school dropouts and child dropouts and uh, you know, what do we do in that area. Especially, I think there's a lot of ingenuity in our know, kids. Before Professor answers that, I have a request also. Yes, please, right. I'm working with the OPEA, Organization Professional, Professional Association. We have a subcommittee, career guidance and skill and human resource development. We are trying to get together. I, I hope uh, Mr. Harsha will be, we all will be coming out because we are trying to show that these are people, the role models we have who have broken the marriage, traditional marriage. Right? I hope you will be coming and helping us take that idea to the schools as well. So, thank you. Thank you. So, let's kind of delve a little bit about what do we do with the great question around people who drop out and is there potential to tap into the community that is good? I mean, there are a lot of people drop out not necessarily because you know, not the time. There are many circumstances. Dr. Ajit, any thoughts in your question? Yes, Madhu, okay, one thing is, you know, why, why? Why do children drop out, you know? I mean, the guy, guy who does repairs in my house, uh, he tells me that he passed whatever, well, then he didn't have a school to go because the school where he could go for whatever was in the city and he didn't have time, uh, money to uh, go there. So he became a mission pass, you know? Uh, but now the, the, the situation has changed, you know, the government, government uh, over the years have invested a lot in technology. So if you look at the course, okay, well, I mean, the ideal situation is, okay, we reduce these dropout rates. Now the technology is there, you know, uh, there are many schools who have internet connections, who have uh, computers, and, and when, when these things were delivered, one of the problems that we had was the content. You know, we, we didn't have anything to uh, use these computers and the internet. But now, now the thing has changed. You know, the, the, the things like Khan Academy uh, at the school level, the uh, university courses, they are, they are pretty available. I mean, that, that is what I tell my uh, university students. Uh, when I teach, you know, you don't have to listen to me. You go and listen to a, a professor from MIT and Stanford and then come and teach me something new as well, you know, what you have learned. Because that is what the, what the technology has done that. But the only, only, only issue I see is 
that we are not taking advantage of what we have. We, we always criticize okay, what we don't have. I mean, what, what would we take? Uh, because I know that there are tuition classes where the, the students just look at the screen. Right? Where, where the teacher teaches in one, uh, one floor, the other three floors, you know, they, they just look at the screen, you know, which is projected. I mean, if you can do that, why not uh, look at a computer screen and listen to Khan Academy in, in, in Singhala and, and, and learn maths, okay? So that is, that is the course, you know, we can address the course, it, it can be done. Now, uh, now, coming back to the question, uh, Madhu, you know, yeah, when many of these people, many students, you know, they, when you say you fail at all level, one of the major reasons is mathematics and science, you know. If you don't get math, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't pass the subject, you don't pass all level. Right? So, but, but the creativity, the innovation is not only mathematics, right? Because we do not have an education system that will, will that can target, you know, the individual student. In, in, in other countries, in Western countries, now it is coming up, you know, we target individual students and to identify their weaknesses. And it doesn't happen here, you know, you just, we, we can't, you know, we can't cope up with that. We have a classroom full of 40, 50 students. A teacher cannot give individual attention to student and, and bring him up, you know, okay, identify what the problems are. But, but that does not mean that that person is not creative, not innovative. And, and if you go to uh, this uh, unit test commission and, and what, what kids do in schools, you know, they are, they are pretty innovative. I, mean, I, I see innovation is there. It is just, I think, uh, she's right that we, we, need to, we need to create a forum where we can identify these people and, and then, then maybe you, they might not need you know, millions, you know. It might be some small amount of money that would, that would create the next entrepreneur, you know. Even without followers. That's a great question. On the second question about uh, uh, women entrepreneurship uh, or women entrepreneurs, I would like to really tap into Dr. Harold's experience in other parts of the world. You know, you really have seen this in Thailand, Malaysia and, and other parts. You know, how, how does this been? addressed in uh, other parts of Asia? I, I go back to mentorship and role models. Uh, so I think uh, women who are successful have to step up to mentoring other women. Uh, I tried, uh, not yet successful, to create uh, an entrepreneurial initiative for, for women from Muslim majority countries. And I think that's very important, right? Uh, I said before I worked in Saudi, and I'd like to see some of the Muslim majority countries step up to creating an environment for women. It's yet to happen. That's great. I, I just wanted to add, uh, she asked something for the point she made. I, I have a quite a, uh, I, I don't know that exactly, I have a different view as well on this. You know, I mean, if you really take all these profiles, you know, we, we we need to have a social mindset change in this country. Do we respect uh, our carpenters? Do we respect our masons? People who are doing farming? Do they get the same respect and dignity? A software engineer or a computer scientist or a doctor or, 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 or a lawyer? If you take any other country, they get the same respect and it's probably, uh, I mean, it's a, quite a lucrative job. It's a highly paid job. <coughs> so, I, I mean, but we don't do that. In the future, if, if, I mean, if all of us try to get into the knowledge economy, I mean, we will not have skilled people in our other sectors. So, so we need to, put, I mean, organizations like yours has to step in and create that social mindset change in this country. Probably together with media, we should start giving them value uh, for the services they do. We, they should have the same respect as a doctor or engineer. Because, I mean, the whole system, whole uh, system breaks down if we don't have the, uh, these people in the ecosystem. So, just a quick, quick turn on if you don't mind. I, 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 I cited this example in the past, but I'd like to just to address the lady's comment. I'd like to point out what happened in Sri Lanka in 1996 when the cricket team won the World Cup. If you ask the question, what led to Sri Lanka, a small country at that time, maybe 18 million people, win, win the World Cup. The seeds of that were sown 10 years earlier 
when, regardless of which school you went to, regardless of which ethnicity you were, which economic, social, economic background you had, you had an equal opportunity of being recognized and being selected to the National Cricket Team. Whereas in the 1960s, you had to go to two particular schools in Colombia to play for Sri Lanka team. Now, if you look at ourselves as a nation, that if we can equip each and every student with the necessary skills and the tools to take advantage of a capitalist system of economics, we will create more entrepreneurs, we will create more world class businesses and we will win the world cup of business. Unfortunately, we are not equipping a student in Monragala or a student in Nayatakani with the same sort of skills and the level of exposure that a more privileged student would have in a, in a Columbia based school and therefore the problem of the fifth grade scholarship or anything to a better school, etc. So I think one of the simplest ways of achieving that is creating a greater entrepreneurial culture where I think we must stop using the word dropout. But dropping out is, a, is really a result of really the O-levels and the A-level exam not keeping up with modern day requirements of education. I mean, the A-level is probably the worst exam we could put, put our children through. Yeah, I, I won't say more, but I'm too much. That's a great point about you know, having the right uh, skills being given at that point. Uh, last question, I saw you. Yeah, I'm sorry, this is more of a comment about this uh, whole other dropout thing because it's something that I personally feel very strongly about. Right? Um, I think one thing is your 40%, it's, it will be interesting to see if that's the actual dropout rate or the number of people who do not proceed to A levels. Because as uh, Dr. Ajit said, you know, I have plenty of technicians who work for me who they stopped at all levels because they simply could not afford the tuition classes to do the levels and they thought, you know, what's the point? I can't afford it, so why not? Why, why should I do it? I'll go become a mason or a carpet or something like that. Uh, the second point that I wanted to also address is that, you know, the education system in Sri Lanka is quite good, but tuition is becoming a business where even your know, school teachers who are normally working in schools are just waiting to get out of school and get those same students back into a tuition class so that they can make more money out of it. Because, I mean, the cost of living is increasing and teachers' salaries, government salaries, things like that are not not panning out uh, to, to, to uh, reach that. It may be different for the university sector, but definitely in schools, I know it's quite low. So perhaps you guys can do something about, you know, improving those circumstances and that might end up, uh, that might end up uh, making things better. And also, the fact that they are all the world dropouts by no means means that they are not intelligent. Like two of my highest skilled technicians are all level dropouts. But I have no problem sending them even abroad to get training from OEMs on that on, on those particular subsystems because they're just that intelligent. They may not understand English very well, but they can still get the knowledge and come back to Sri Lanka and and, and use that apply that knowledge that they give. Thanks for that point. That's exactly what the Hacha was talking about earlier as well. Question. So I'm cognizant of time, we are 8.45, uh, I'd like to uh, wrap up here and uh, close out uh, and give it to you to close out the session from here. And thanks a lot for your uh, enthusiastic questions and uh, panel for doing a wonderful job in answering some of that. Thank you. As you see, I have two booty bags from Microsoft, which is a uh, lucky uh, participants today are going to get. But before that, I just want to add something uh, to the question uh, from, from the uh, lady before. See, we do have an initiative called Future Careers, uh, which is actually Madhu's chair before, well before he became chairman of Glasgow, which, uh, you know, uh, strives to educate school children um, on the alternative ways of entering uh, the, the, the employment in the Nina industry and also, at some point, entrepreneurship. We've been there for a few years, we've done one-to-one -one, uh, you know, uh, counseling and mentoring. Problem is that sheer scale, there are 4.3 million school children in the country, we must have covered about 30,000, 40,000 people over the last five years yeah. of this program. So obviously we have program. Yeah. It's probably with the sheer scale yeah. of you know, taking yeah. those programs up to cover so many people, that's the challenge. I think we're happy to work with OPE and so many other organizations to get that. So quick uh, wrap up of today's event first, I'd like to invite Janaki Tana, who is the manager for community engagement from Microsoft. She will hand out uh, these two goodie badges to Microsoft uh, uh, for those who were kind enough to drop their business cards. So Janaki, join us and... and So 
um, our first winner is, if she's still here, Rochelle Ekenaita. Is Rochelle with us? Okay, I think she's made a move. Uh, Milan Paduka. Is Milan here? Okay. Uh, we've gone with the third to then, I think we had anticipated. Uh, KRP Senegirata is a civil engineer. Yes, Senegirata, please come up. And, uh, We have one more. M. Ashrafan is. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite Mr. Vindu Piris, uh, General Secretary of Slasco, Managing Director of Stax uh, Inc. Sri Lanka Operations, and more importantly, Head of our Entrepreneurship and Membership Forums, to come up and hand over tokens of appreciation to our uh, panelists and our keynote speaker. First, uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Hal. Thank you so much for coming down and sharing your insights. Uh, looking at the level of profile of, of work you have done, I'm sure your consultancy fees must be very high. And so I'd like to thank uh, our friends from the American Embassy, uh, Dom Sumi, and also from the University of Morocco for the coordination. Thank you so much. Uh, then we have uh, uh, my good friend Harshapur Singha. Harshapur, thank you so much for taking time off your very big schedule to be with us and, and uh, uh, handing out advice. Of course, we have Madhu. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Ajit. And last but not least, our good friend Mahaz uh, as well. Uh, a quick thank you to the US Embassy in Sri Lanka and Maldives and our partners Microsoft. Uh, somebody asked me whether the video of this valuable event will be available. Yes, uh, our educational uh, partner LearnPP has recorded this. Actually, there is a live feed going on out, out uh, now as well. And you can watch it uh, once they put it up. Uh, LearnPP uh, is our education media partner. Uh, we also have uh, a blog going uh, together with the feed from our online uh, media partner for this event, Digi. And obviously, Sascom is having our own hard drives at the back doing the Twitter and blog as well. Uh, we also have uh, our corporate communication provider, Dialog, which helped us by providing this auditorium and this history for a number of years. Thank you to them as well. Uh, you would not have heard about this event except through our uh, print media partner, Daily News, who helped us. Uh, last but not least uh, is Reza and his team at Citrus. Wonderful event as usual, very professional. Once we had to, then we didn't have to worry about anything else. So thank you, Reza and Citrus. They've helped us a lot in the past as well. Thank you for all to each and every one of you. Right, it's Friday night. I've got a text from my wife saying that uh, that uh, you know I've taken valuable time from uh, uh, weekend. So I've taken time. You have taken time of your weekends to be with us. And uh, unfortunately, our upcoming events are all sold out. Oh, sorry, some of them are free, but. All of them are full of registration. So we have a uh, mobile book camp happening on the 13th. I don't think we can take any more registrations. Every single event in 2014 has had triple or quadruple registrations than last year. Right? Uh, some are free, some are you know, expensive. And I think that is really one that in the way out offshoring destination of the year. And that has truly galvanized the kind of interest in this event. It's shocking to me and my small team to see, I mean, the event we had trading yesterday, 30 people usually come, we had 100 odd people who paid and paid. Right? And we had to turn off another so many people. So we have a couple of events coming up, but uh, we will inform you, but I don't think there's much left in terms of registration space. So they, they, uh, when we do advertise events, please register early um, and you can be with us. Obviously, we have auditorium and other questions. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, our panelists will be available for a little bit more longer uh, to, you know, if you have any questions that you can ask them, please. And also, uh, you can see the entire field of this up very shortly. Thank you so much. We'll see you at another session. Good night.